Good morning, brothers and sisters, and a warm welcome also to all guests who are here in our midst. We hope that our worship today is a pleasing to the Lord our God, and that any guests who are with us might feel open and welcomed here. If you are visiting with us and would like to have a place to visit for coffee perhaps or for lunch, uh, our host family today is brother and sister Dan and Michelle Schulenberg. They were, and their children were handing out the liturgies before the service. You'll be able to find them after the service as well. Uh, but before we do begin, brothers and sisters, there are a number of announcements to be made once I find them. Uh, the following have requested to make a public profession of their faith. Denver Bikima, Dylan Boss, Joyce Malky, Brody Mance, and Liam Mans. At due examination, the consistory has decided to grant their request and thereby admit them to the celebration of the Lord's Supper. If no lawful objection is brought forward, their public profession of faith will take place, the Lord willing, Sunday, May the 28th, in the morning service. The consistory announces that Joel Robert Workman and Caitlin Christine Jonker have indicated their intention to enter into the married state according to the ordinance of God. They desire to begin this holy state in the name of the Lord and to complete it to his glory. If no lawful objection is brought forward, the ceremony will take place, the Lord willing, on June the 2nd, at 2.30 in the afternoon at the Canadian Reformed Church in Smithville. The history announces that Stephen Hendrick Ravensbergen and Tanya Lynn Bartels have indicated their intention to enter into the married state according to the ordinance of God. They desire to begin this holy state in the name of the Lord and to complete it to his glory. If no lawful objection is brought forward, the ceremony will take place, the Lord willing, on June the 2nd at 1.30 in the afternoon at the Addercliffe Canadian Reformed Church. And this week, the offertory is for the Ministry of Mercy, and likewise also on Thursday evening when we'll have our Ascension Day service. Thus far, the announcements, brothers and sisters. Our call to worship this morning is taken from 1 Chronicles 16. And sing to the Lord, all the earth. Tell of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among all the peoples. For great is the Lord, greatly to be praised, and he is to be feared above all gods. Beloved of Christ, if you're able, please rise for worship. Having gathered here and together on this day, let us humbly confess that our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. Amen. Receive the Lord's greeting. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's sing together now in praise to the Lord our God with the words of Psalm 66. We'll sing stanzas four and six.
Let us read God's holy law together. Exodus 20, we read, God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers and the children to the third and the fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male servant or your female servant, your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant, his female servant, his ox, his donkey, or anything that is your neighbor's. And this uh, law, where our Savior reminds us, is summarized also through the Old Testament law. He teaches us that you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Let's sing in response to this law, brothers and sisters, with the words of Psalm 51. We'll sing stanzas 6 and 7.
Let us pray together. Our gracious and merciful God and Father, we thank you that you wash us clean, and you are the one who receives those who are humbled. You are the one who looks upon us with grace and with mercy. You forgive us our sins. Indeed, O Lord, we do confess before you that our sins are great, our transgressions many. We daily fall short of what your perfection would expect. And what we do offer to you, O Lord, is not sufficient for the praise and the glory of your most holy name. For you, O Lord, are so far beyond us. You are great, you are glorious, you are sovereign, you are from everlasting and for everlasting. You alone are eternal and unchanging and almighty and all-knowing. You are the mighty one. And the praise that we offer to you is but limited. And what we can lift up to you in thanksgiving is but a pittance. And yet, O oh Lord, this is what we bring to you. We sing to you. We tell of the salvation you give to us. We declare your glories. For you are great. You are to be greatly praised. We thank you, O oh Lord, that this is pleasing before you. Help us, O oh Lord, by your spirit to safeguard ourselves against any other thought when it comes to your worship. Help us, O oh Lord, not to become arrogant in our worship, to think that what we offer is what is necessary for you to receive. I think that what we have to offer is what gives to you strength, is what is necessary for you to bless us and to be with us. That somehow what we have to offer is what you require in order to have the strength or the wisdom or the knowledge to come to our aid. Drive such thoughts from our hearts and our minds, O oh Lord, and allow us to humble ourselves before you in thanksgiving. Teach us through your word that this is how we are to make our petitions before you. And remind us, O oh Lord, that even as we seek your blessing upon crops, upon labor, upon all the things that we stand in need of day by day to live, and you do not bless such things, because we come to you in prayer and you are obligated to do so, that you do so in grace and in mercy and in love. And so we pour out thanksgiving to you. Guide us and protect us as we read your word, as we are reminded of this glorious truth in your word. Be with us as we open your holy scriptures that, we, that they might shine a light to our paths to teach us and to instruct us and to remind us of how great you are and how we are to live in thankfulness before you. Guide us and protect us. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. This morning, we look at Psalm 50, and I invite you to turn with me there in your uh, Bibles. You can find Psalm 50 here in the middle on page 473, if you're using the Pew Bible, page 473. It's a psalm of Asaph. And in this psalm, the Lord God comes to his people Israel, he calls them together, and he lays before them a charge. A charge that they are not sacrificing to him on his grace, on his mercy, but in their own strength, according to their own volition, thinking that what they have to offer is what God stands in need of. The Lord reminds them that he alone is mighty and has no need. Page 473. The mighty one, God the Lord, speaks and summons the earth from the rising of the sun to its setting. Out of Zion, the perfection of beauty, God shines forth. Our God comes, he does not keep silence. Before him is a devouring fire, around him a mighty tempest. He calls to the heavens above and to the earth that he may judge his people. Gather to me my faithful ones who made a covenant with me by sacrifice. The heavens declare his righteousness. God himself is judge. 
Hear, O my people, and I will speak. O Israel, I will testify against you. I am God, your God. Not for your sacrifices do I rebuke you. Your burnt offerings are continually before me. But I will not accept a bull from your house or goats from your folds. For every beast of the forest is mine, the cattle on a thousand hills. I know all the birds of the hills and all that moves in the field is mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell you, for the world and its fullness are mine. Do I eat the flesh of bulls or drink the blood of goats? Offer to God a sacrifice of thanksgiving. Perform your vows to the Most High. Call upon me in the day of trouble, and I will deliver you, and you shall glorify me. But to the wicked, God says, what right have you to recite my statutes or take my covenant on your lips? For you hate discipline, and you cast my words behind you. If you see a thief, you are pleased with him. You keep company with adulterers. You give your mouth free rein for evil. Your tongue frames deceit. You sit and speak against your brother. You slander your own mother's son. These things you have done, and I have been silent. You thought that I was one like yourself. But now I rebuke you and lay the charge before you. Mark this, then, you who forget God, lest I tear you apart and there be none to deliver. The one who offers thanksgiving as a sacrifice glorifies me. To the one who orders his way rightly, I will show the salvation of God. Thus far from God's holy word, let's now rise if we're able to sing a preparation. This psalm put to music, Psalm 50, will sing the stanzas 1, 5, and 6.
Here in this psalm, brothers and sisters, our Lord God teaches us who he is and who we are before him, how we are to live in response to him. Now, the sacrifices we give to him are not a payment to him, but it is to be given in thanksgiving. Verses 12 through 15, we read, If I were hungry, I would not tell you, for the world and its fullness are mine. Do I eat the flesh of bulls or drink the blood of goats? Offer to God a sacrifice of thanksgiving. Perform your vows to the Most High. Call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you. You shall glorify me. Brothers and sisters loved by Christ, this day is a special day in society. It's the second Sunday of the month of May. And as all the good little boys and girls here know, that means it's Mother's Day. It's a day to be thankful for mothers, for all the work that they do, all the care they provide, all the love that they show their children. All the hours that they spend day in, day out, caring, raising, providing, loving children. And while on each day appreciation is expressed, Mother's Day in particular is a day for showing thankfulness. And Mother's Day is not payment. It's not payment for all the hard work our moms do. It's not as though our moms do all the work only because we'll give them some flowers and make them breakfast once a year. Mother's Day isn't a day to settle our debts that we owe to the ladies who bore us in their womb and cared for us 24-7, 365. And I think it was. It'd be rather insulting, wouldn't it? If that's what we thought, Mother's Day would turn from being a lovely day full of joy and thanksgiving into an insulting, demeaning day that effectively ridicules, minimizes all that our moms do for us. Our moms don't deserve Mother's Day. If anything, they would deserve Mother's Year. And I don't think that anyone here thinks something like that. But such a mindset can creep into our minds when it comes to worshiping the Lord. And indeed, that's exactly what this psalm addresses in part. The idea that our worship serves as some sort of payment, some sort of tribute to God. That sacrifices are what God needs in order to come to us and to provide for us and to support us. And so what ought to be worship done in thankfulness is instead an insult to God, since it's treated as compensation, as payment, as something that God needs from us by the people offering it. And so he reminds his people that this is not the case. He has no need for what we have to offer. He doesn't depend on us. He doesn't rely on our worship. He only desires what we offer when it is done in the right manner, when it is in thankfulness, in gratitude, to him. So let us reflect upon the words of this psalm that reminds us to be thankful to God in the appropriate manner. We'll do so with the following theme and points. The God who needs nothing gives grace to the grateful. What we think God wants, what God actually wants, and what God promises to do. The God who needs nothing gives grace to the grateful. Now, the picture that's painted here, brothers and sisters, is that of a courtroom. We have the mighty one, God the Lord. He comes in order to call his people to account. For they're called to worship, but he knows that there are so many who do not. And so he calls everyone in order to bring their shortcomings to account. The psalm very poetically and powerfully sets the scene. It's not merely a plain narrative of God being judge. No, just as the psalm will also highlight that God needs nothing from us, so even in setting the scene, that's going to be 
emphasize. All the earth is summoned. Everything that the light of the sun touches is under God's jurisdiction, from the rising of the sun to its setting. And Zion itself, that mountain of God, a hill that signifies God's presence on earth in the midst of his people, showcases the power and the majesty of God. And action unfolds in the call to this court, itself also displaying God as the mighty one. Before him as a devouring fire, around him a mighty tempest, both heaven and earth hear his voice. It's declared without doubt, God himself is judge. Now, if you've been to an ordinary courtroom here in Canada, it's immediately obvious who the judge is. That the last to appear, they come in through a door that nobody else uses. The presence that's announced, everyone rises. They take their seat above everyone else, and everyone immediately knows that they have the final say. How much more so when the courtroom reaches from east to west, from earth to heaven, his heralds include the stars of the sky, his presence is announced by powerful winds and fires. God is judge, and he is mighty. And with the scene established, the case begins in earnest, and it becomes clear that God has a solid case. He's taking issue with the worship that his people bring to him. And it's not directly stated. God begins by saying it's not about the sacrifices. It's not about the burnt offerings. It's not about the people forgetting about the sacrifices to the Lord. No, It's about how they were bringing these sacrifices. What sort of attitude that they had when they were bringing them forward. After all, the burnt offerings, the sacrifices that they were bringing, they were in accordance with this holy law. God didn't have an issue with a sacrificial system. He was the one who instituted it. After all, you can read about such sacrifices and their regulations being prescribed in the book of Leviticus. These were sacrifices God wanted. Nor is it about the quality of the sacrifices being offered. God took issue with Israel through his prophet Malachi as the Israelites weren't truly sacrifices. They were only giving up the sickly and the weak. They were bringing sacrifices as an afterthought, almost begrudgingly. Now that's not the problem here. It's not that the Israelites didn't want to bring sacrifices to God. No. But there is perhaps something more insulting to the Lord than that. You see, beloved of Christ, the people of Israel, the people of God, had begun to adopt the attitude of the peoples around them. They had to bring these sacrifices, they had to, in order to give God strength. That if God was going to help them, they first had to help God. That God was depending on them in order to bring this worship, in order to live. That he was looking forward to what they had to offer every day. In effect, they were comparing God to the other gods, that he was a God who needed them, that he was dependent on them. Certainly not the case. God does not need our gifts. God is not in our debt. God does not owe us anything. Bringing worship to God does not make him obligated to respond with blessing upon us. It's not as though as us showing up to church properly dressed and singing the right psalms and saying the proper prayers, ensuring the offering bag is filled up, will somehow ensure, guarantee, compel God to show favor upon us. That Smithville will be blessed, that we will prosper, that our crops will grow, and that our labor will be fruitful. Sometimes this mindset can inadvertently, subconsciously creep in. We think that God will bless our labors if only we bring the correct worship to him. This can creep in through covenantal obligations that the Lord has placed before us. 
After all, the Lord has indeed said, he will bless those who follow in his ways. He will curse those who rebel against him. All Israel had to stand opposite each other on two mountains. Speak about these things. They were instructed to do so in Deuteronomy 11 and 27, and they fulfilled it. They carried it out in Joshua 8. Blessed are those who keep the Lord's words. Cursed are those who reject him and turn him away from him. But this mindset of God depending on us is not how the covenant works. We must be on guard against thinking that by responding to the covenant, we're giving God what he needs. That this is what is necessary for us to be blessed. For though the actions are what God prescribes for us, the attitude can quickly become one of pride and arrogance, self-importance. I'm the chosen one, the chosen child. I'm redeemed in Christ. I'm living a Christian life. I'm living by God's law. Look at everyone else. If I were not standing firm here in Smithville, no church would exist. Nobody would worship God. God wouldn't be known anymore. But as the Lord makes abundantly clear in this psalm, he is not dependent on us. John the Baptist reminded the covenant people of Israel of this. Do not presume to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able to lift from these stones children for Abraham. God does not depend on us. He does not want us to think that we need to keep his worship up in order to be blessed. He's not some sort of machine that we pour gasoline into to turn on and run properly. We don't have to recharge him in order to receive blessing. Such thinking is definitively rejected by God. The insult that it plays to who he is as the mighty one is demonstrated in his sentence. I will accept no bowl from your house. God will refuse such worship. He will reject those who think they can control him. He doesn't want their worship. He declares their religious deeds to be meaningless, to have no purpose. They're empty so long as they continue with such arrogant attitude. The Lord doesn't just leave it at that, beloved. He doesn't simply say that he'll reject his people, but he does declare that those who call upon him in true thanksgiving, who properly glorifies him, to them he shows salvation. So what does God actually want, beloved? It seems like an awfully fine balance to play here, isn't it? And on the one hand, is all these sacrifices to offer to God. Anyone familiar with Israelite history, reading through the Old Testament, can recall how time and again, God punishes Israel for not worshiping him, for failing to keep his ways, for not bringing sacrifices to him. And now he's taking issue with the sacrifices, even though they're being offered in the way that he prescribes seems as though it's, it's almost impossible to keep God happy. Don't offer him sacrifices and judgment comes. Offer him sacrifices and judgment comes. What exactly are we supposed to do for the one who is in charge of everything, who already has everything? It's actually a question that many cynical people might have. If God is all-knowing and all-powerful, if God is in control of all things, and what exactly does he need or want from me? What can I offer this sovereign king? Am I not little more than a puppet in his hands? Does he not have everything he could possibly want? Perhaps that's on a lesser degree. That's a thought some of you might have had, thinking what to get your mom for today. What can I get my mom when her house is beautiful, the gardens are furnished, she has no lack of anything and nothing could be truer for God. 
He's never hungry. He has no need for our sacrifices, nor of the Israelites. He doesn't eat the bulls or the goats. As a spiritual being, he has no need of anything in this physical realm and the whole universe. Unlike the other gods, those false gods, he doesn't grow weak because his people forget about him. It's not a symbiotic relationship with the Lord. Paul says this to the Athenians, God is not served by human hands as though he needed anything, for he himself gives to all men life and breath and everything. And so the Lord corrects his people, forms the text this morning, offer to God a sacrifice of thanksgiving. Perform your vows to the most high. Call upon me in the day of trouble. It's not to be a sacrifice of bulls and goats from a position of power, but from thanksgiving. If I'm to give something to God, it's only because I've received it from him beforehand. God is the one who's given it to me. God is the one who's given me life. And all of our giving must be done in gratefulness for the grace he pours out on us. So our sacrifice is to be a response to what God has given. It's not an initiative on our part. It's not we who come to God. It's not what we do first, but what God does for us. As John writes, we love because he first loved us. Thankfulness, gratitude for grace, this is what defines our worship before him. And that's what the catechism says to us as well. Our lives are to be lives of thankfulness before him. And this is how we are to understand vows. Even despite the Lord saying that he needs nothing from us, we still have this language here of paying vows. Now the ESV gets around this somewhat by speaking of performing your vows. But it is still speaking of paying a vow. But I appreciate the language being used by our translation today since it draws our mindset away from the idea of payment like with a salary or a bribe or a bill. A vow is a promise you make before the Lord and it's carried out in response to his grace and faithfulness. It's not a paycheck, but rather a commitment to keep your promise, to keep your word. More than that, performing the vow means you continue to trust in the only trustworthy one. You've committed to the owner of all things. You've looked back at how he's helped you before, and you're looking forward to how he will be with you as you fulfill the vow. And this is what the Lord wants. This is what God expects from us. We're to respond in thankfulness to him, acknowledging our dependence on him. Even though we have nothing to offer him, we still give what he has given to us in thankfulness. He needs nothing from us, gives everything to us. And so we give back gratitude. So we forced in the final action the reminder to call upon him. One who truly loves God and worships him in an appropriate way will likewise not despair when things aren't going well. They'll call on him in the day of trouble. Because the relationship with the Lord doesn't hinge upon doing good things for God, because it's not about us paying God what he needs in order to help us, When we suffer what, when we fall short, when we struggle, that's not a cue for us to stop giving to God. It's not as though God isn't getting enough from us in order to help us. For God's not the one who gets in trouble. God's not the one who needs help. He alone is the mighty one. He alone is the one who can save He alone is the one who does not hunger or suffer want, can freely give to those who do hunger and suffer. When we acknowledge he already has all things, has no need for anything, we can come to him and seek his help when we are in need. This is the correct perspective, the right mindset. That's what God actually wants from us. 
And when we come to him in a humble way, when we seek to do his will, we may witness what God promises to do. We had mentioned earlier that the Lord was setting the scene as a courtroom in this psalm. It's important for us to understand what exactly God is seeking in this case. What's his goal in bringing this forward? What's he trying to accomplish? It's not merely correcting his people. It's not merely bringing judgment against them for not worshiping him, worshiping him in an appropriate way. No, it's more than that. As God said in his action, we will glorify him. Verse 15, I will deliver you and you will glorify me. You see, beloved, God isn't just putting us in our place. This psalm isn't merely about making us know how much better he is than us. It's about showing us what the proper relationship with our holy God looks like. His goal is his glory through our salvation. When we are delivered, he receives praise and adoration. It's something beautifully displayed through his work of his son. A sacrifice upon the cross is a shining light of the mighty one who comes to deliver his people. Christ Jesus alone, being true God, being the mighty one, is the one able to do so. He reminds us we can bring nothing to God, that God has no need for anything we can offer. Indeed, the only way forward for us to be saved is not for us to offer sacrifices to God in order for him to receive strength, but for him to come in the flesh himself to offer a perfect sacrifice as payment. This shows to us how generous our God is. This shows to us what we may have in him. God gives so much to us, beloved. Indeed, he gives everything to us. We can read in Romans 8, He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Paul emphasizes the point that we've already received so much in Christ Jesus from the one who has everything. There's no reason for us to doubt God will give us so much more because of him. If he's willing to give up his son, he's willing to give us what he himself has no need for. For us, we can therefore keep God's greatness in the center of our hearts and minds when we come to him. We can recognize that God is indeed the mighty one. There's nothing that we can offer him that he needs. We can be on guard against a mindset that our praise and worship is necessary for the Lord to be able to bless us. And that can liberate us. That can free us. Because of that glorious truth, we can come to him in prayer for everything we need. That means that when we ask him for help and support, also materially, he is present. When we struggle to make ends meet, We can trust in him. We don't need to worry about whether or not our financial contributions are what causes him to bless us. We can freely give back to him what he has so graciously and generously given to us. And we can trust he will deliver us in all situations. And it's not just on a day for remembering crops and labor that we acknowledge our dependence on God, but throughout the year. Now, there is also a warning in this psalm that we do well to pay mind to. Our egos are quick to presume more for ourselves than for others. Hand in hand with feeling that we can give God what he wants goes the attitude that we can therefore do what we want, that we're in control. And so God is made more like man. Verse 21, God says, You thought that I was one, like yourself. And our own sins are downplayed, especially when they're advantageous to us. If I tell this lie, or if I associate with this particular sin, I'll get ahead. 
I'll gain so much more. I need to do this business practice in order to stay competitive. I have to take on this particular job in order to stay afloat. We're so quick to take matters into our own hands rather than trust in the one who owns all the beasts of the forest and the birds of the hills. We think that the words that we say, even words that aren't true or are said against someone else, even our own families, the words that we say have more weight than the words of the one who summons the earth. But the one who breaks silence with a devouring fire and a mighty tempest is the one whose word we should look to and be reminded that our own words count as nothing compared with his. We have no need to sin to get ahead. We see in this psalm there's indeed a recurring theme of the arrogance of man and what he thinks that he has. The undercurrent behind this behavior, both that behavior of the clearly wicked at the end of the psalm, but also the behavior of those who claim to be part of the covenant community, that undercurrent is one that does not properly trust in God does not properly acknowledge him as the one that the psalm opens with, the mighty one. But those who know that God is capable of all things, owning all things, needing nothing from man, they see the thread that's being weaved through this psalm. They hear the warning of its end. Mark this then, you who forget God. It's a warning for us to take to heart. Do we forget God? Do we forget that he is the mighty one, that he is not dependent on our worship? Do we forget that he hears all that we say, all that we think, all that we do? Do we forget that he alone is capable of providing us for all that we need? That he's not waiting on us. With what do we come before our God, beloved? What attitude do we bring him this spring as we look ahead to the work of our hands this year? Will the crops grow because of us? Will our businesses flourish because of our work? Will this church be built up on the merits of our worship? Let us humble ourselves before this mighty one, God the Lord, and let us offer to him acceptable worship not ones with terms and conditions. Let us humble ourselves before him. Acknowledge that we bring nothing, that all blessings are his grace alone. And let us remember to call on him in the basis of Christ Jesus, not on the basis of things going well for us. Let us glorify our God and receive salvation from him alone. Amen. Let's sing in response now from this psalm once more. Psalm 50, we'll sing stanzas 7 and 11.
Let's come before our Lord God with thanksgiving. Gracious and merciful God and Father, we thank you that you are an almighty God, a God who has no need of anything. You are alone, the Lord and giver of life. You alone are the fount of all that is good. You alone are the one from whom and for whom and to whom all things exist. And so what we can bring before you is insufficient in the praise of your name. And yet, O Lord, we bring it to you all the same. For we are grateful to you. We are thankful for all that you do, all that you've done and all that you continue to do for us. We are thankful that you give to us new life in Christ Jesus, that you work in us by your spirit, that you bless us day by day all the days of our lives, that even though we live in a world that is broken by sin, we are not abandoned, but that there is a hope for eternity on this earth made new again. We thank you for the peace that gives us, for the hope that gives us, and the strength that you provide living before you and the blessings you pour out day by day and year by year. Indeed, O Lord, we give thanks to you for the years that you give to us. This week in particular, O Lord, and two birthdays we might commemorate. We thank you, O Lord, for the life you give to Brother Andy Whiting. We thank you that he may celebrate 82 years. We thank you for the strength that you give day by day. We ask you, O Lord, to give to him patience with the various struggles that he does have, the limitations on his health also. Give peace as he leans upon you as his Lord and Savior. Likewise, O Lord, be with our brother Jake Boss. We thank you, O Lord, for the light that you give to him and the strength that you provide. Give to him all that he stands in need of also for the year to come. And Father, we thank you that there are so many that can be happily married also. And this week there are three significant anniversaries. Even today, our brother and sister Komdur celebrate 35 years together. Guide them and protect them in the day of celebration as they give thanks to you and equip them for the year to come. At the end of the week also, O oh Lord, and be with Brother and Sister DeBoer in celebrating 35 years. And Lord, we thank you for Brother and Sister Van Woodenberg receiving 55 from you on Thursday. We thank you, O oh Lord, that through the ups and the downs of life, through the graces that you provide, faithfulness to merit of the house may be carried out. Guide and protect them also in the year to come. Father, we thank you that you bless families with children, that you enable so many in our midst to receive children, and that today in particular we can commemorate this gift, especially for the ladies. We ask you, O Lord, to be with all the moms in our midst, be with all those that are expecting children, all those that have received children, and all those that have raised their children in the fear of your name. We ask you, O Lord, to be with those that desire to have children but have not been blessed with any from your hand. Surround them also with your love and your care that they may trust in you and in your ways and give peace and give comfort and give solace. Be with those that have been forced to bury their children and to have a been promoted to glory before they themselves. Grant also comfort for them in this. Lord, today we give thanks in particular with our brother and sister Heemskirk. This past week, our sister could become a mother once more and that they have received together a young boy. Guide them and protect them and bless them in raising Liam in the fear of your holy name. 
Father, we ask you to surround also the, the Nichols with your love and your care. Our young brother has been in and out of the hospital this past week. A grant, O oh Lord, that the various tests may provide an answer. A grant, O oh Lord, that the doctors may be able to provide an answer and they may be able to prescribe treatment and his suffering may be alleviated also. Father, we ask you to be with our sister Judy Vandevelt as well. We thank you that the surgery that she has received went well. And grant that her road to recovery may carry forward in the weeks to come. Guide her and protect her. Lord, we thank you for the hope and the comfort that we may all have together even as we celebrate and even as we lift up needs before you for the joys and the sufferings that we experience. We thank you that we may do so as brothers and sisters in a corporate environment, and that together we may be called the brothers and sisters here in the Smithville Canadian Reformed Church. Grant, O Lord, that we may remain faithful to your word. Grant, O Lord, that your word may be faithfully proclaimed week in and week out. Grant, O Lord, that this pulpit may also always be filled by men that are diligent in searching the scriptures and are seeking to strengthen your people in the grace that you provide. Guide us and protect us, therefore, in the congregational meeting that we are about to have. A grant that the proposal may be sufficiently discussed, O Lord, and may you guide however the election may go, however the vote may go. Give wisdom and discernment also in the weeks to come. Father, we ask you to be with the proclamation of your word wherever it goes, indeed to the very ends of the earth. And so we ask you to also bless the mission work that is being done in Timor. Guide and protect our missionary there, Reverend Deeth, and give to him all that he stands in need of. And likewise, O oh Lord, we ask you to be with those that go to support for a short time. Lord, may you bless the work that is about to be done by the Wings of Hope mission team. As they depart this week, Lord, even tomorrow night as they take off in the wee hours of Tuesday morning. We ask you to be with those in our midst that go. Lord, guide and protect them with your love and your care. Give to Moses Deethan and to Simon Heemskirk and to the Spoolstra sisters also all that they stand in need of as they fly. And Father, we thank you for all the preparation that could have been undertaken in that as well. Father, we lay these things before you, knowing that you hear us, that you receive us, and that you respond to us not out of obligation, not because the voices that we've lifted to you in praise and worship is sufficient, but in the grace that you pour out for us. In Jesus' name alone, amen. As has been previously mentioned, the offertory today is for the ministry of mercy at the hands of the deacons. After it has been gathered together, let's rise together to sing our closing hymn of praise. Hymn 76, stanzas 1 and 2.
Receive now the blessing of our Lord God and go your way in peace. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Amen.